This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Simon Phipps, my co-host, and I will be talking this week with Brian Bellendorf, who's one of the great figures in the history of the web and also runs the Hyperledger Project at the Linux Foundation. That's coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they are working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 592, recorded Wednesday, August 19th, 2020. Hyperledger Update. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technology's Advanced Technology Center is like no other testing and research lab with more than a half billion dollars of equipment, including OEMs like NetApp, and it's virtual so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all that it offers, go to www.t.com slash twit. And by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is ridiculously fast. You can stream everything in HD quality with zero buffering. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash floss. Hello, everybody. I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly, and I'm joined this week by Simon Phipps himself, who is somewhere, I can guess. I am... Uh, as usual in my uh, in my lair in the woods in Southampton in the United Kingdom, where having had uh, wet the weather that you normally have in California for the last uh, two weeks, we've suddenly had the weather that they normally have in Seattle. Uh, ah, so, well, I'm uh, in the, at the moment in San Marino, California, which is where it was 107 degrees Fahrenheit yesterday, which I think is like. Uh, what is it like 45 or something like that? Uh, yeah. Celsius it was, it was oven like out there, but, uh, but I'm inside where it's air conditioned. It's going to be like that again today. I'm told pretty crazy, pretty crazy. And we have yeah. fires too. I can see fires. I can see clouds rising in the sky that look like normal clouds because that they're produced by flames on the ground. Welcome to California. <laughs> so, um, so our, our our guest this time is Brian Bellendorf. Are you 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 and I know Brian from forever, right? Yeah, we've known Brian for really a very very long time. And in actual fact, <laughs> um, he's been when, a lot. <laughs> well, but back when Randall was doing the show, uh, we interviewed uh, Brian back in 2017 when he had just taken over uh, the uh, Hyperledger project, which is at the Linux Foundation. And um, and so this is this is uh, Hyperledger Redux. And if we get bored with that, I think you and I both know enough about Brian to have a very interesting roving conversation about completely <laughs> un-Bitcoin related subjects if we want to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we will. But first, a few words about our sponsor, Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technology began building their Advanced Technology Center, or ATC, 10 years ago, and it has grown exponentially. It's like no other testing and research lab. His lab contains more than a half billion dollars in equipment from hundreds of OEMs and key partners ranging from heavyweights like NetApp and Cisco to emerging disruptors like Equinix. WWT is a trusted partner who stays with you over the years. Many of their customers have been with them for over a decade because they know WWT is where they can go to get the answers they need to make sure their business runs right. Their ATC is an incubator for IT innovations and offers such as on-demand and schedulable labs like NetApp Cloud Volumes, ONTAP, NetApp Storage Grid, NetApp Disaster Recovery as a Service, along with hundreds of other labs representing newest technologies in flash storage, multi-cloud, hyper-converged infrastructure, cloud data management, and more. Learn about products before you launch. WWT's engineers use these environments to quickly spin up proofs of concept and pilots using the sandbox so customers can confidently select the best solutions. In many cases, this reduces concept time from months to weeks 
which increases speed to market. They offer lab as a service, a dedicated lab space within the ATC. Here, customers can perform programmatic testing using the vast technology ecosystem that WWT has already built. It's virtual, so you can take advantage of ATC's unique benefits anywhere in the world 24-7. Their engineers work in these labs every day, beta testing new equipment and building reference architectures and custom integrations to help their customers make decisions and see results faster and with much less investment. WWT has launched their new digital platform encompassing the ATC ecosystem. This ecosystem creates a multiplier effect of knowledge, speed, and agility anytime, anywhere around the world for their customers. Get access to articles, case studies, hands-on labs, and other tools that make the difference in today's fast-paced world. To learn more and discover why organizations across industries turn to WWT to guide them on their digital transformation journey, visit www.com slash twit. And don't forget to create my WWT account to access resources available through WWT's Advanced Technology Center ecosystem. That's www.com slash twit. WWT, delivering business and technology outcomes around the world. So, our guest today, Brian Bellendorf. Uh, go to Wikipedia and look Brian up. There's so much there, and uh, he's too modest to to brag on all of it. But in the in the current uh, frame of time, he's the executive director of Hyperledger, which is an open source blockchain initiative hosted by the Linux Foundation, which, like Hyperledger, is like a deeply interesting thing uh, to me and I think to our, our our audience here. He's also on the board of the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, the EFF, um, co-founder of the Apache Software Foundation, and, uh, uh, and he <laughs> he does great great stuff with music, which we may or may not get to. And he lives on a farm with goats and chickens, and once took a day trip to Antarctica. All of which are digressions we could go down. Welcome, Brian. It's great to have you on the show today. Thank, thank you, Doug. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> it's great to be here. So, so give us. Um, if you can, kind of like an outline heading of of what what Hyperledger is about um, and where it fits in the in the the Linux Foundation, which is a vast thing too. Yeah. So um, so uh, Hyperledger is an initiative embedded inside the Linux Foundation, um, very much like the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, like uh, LF the LFAI project. Uh, we have projects in the special effects space uh, for, that are used by Pixar and ILM and all those. Um, we've got an automotive grade Linux. Basically, the Linux Foundation, you know, uh, about eight years ago started to branch out beyond the kernel and beyond the Linux operating system to all these adjacent technology domains, uh, cloud computing. There's a giant so uh, networking project, LF networking, that's the basis for software and routers everywhere around the world and telco equipment and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that was before I joined the Linux Foundation, of course, but I, I, Jim Zemlin and, and the others at the LF, I think, realized that the consortium model uh, to for building support for open source projects uh, is uh, seemed to have some legs and 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 was a was a, a solid thing to kind of uh, try to standardize and replicate and take to all these different domains um, and it's very different from the way that say the Apache Software Foundation works or the way the Mozilla Foundation works um, it has vendors involved in funding um, a core team that can be as small as you know a very very part time project manager all the way to a staff of 20 25 people I think on the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, who do all the things other than programming that are necessary for to get open source projects to actually work well. Um, uh, you know, things like uh, marketing, things like managing the trademarks, things like actually managing the developer ecosystem, DevRel and and uh, meeting notes and and that sort of thing. And to, to some degree, be kind of the neutral voice at the center of a commercial ecosystem so that it becomes like this perpetual motion machine, right? You know, uh, people make money off of Kubernetes or off of uh, automotive-grade Linux or these networking products. And then if, if companies 
companies can be profitable, they um, feed that profit back in, not because they're compelled to, but because they realize the intrinsic value of that back into membership in a in a in a project like CNCF or like Hyperledger. And Hyperledger uh, started four years ago. It started <clears throat> about one year before the conversation I had here with with Simon um, uh, in 2017, uh, and it was formed by uh, a set of very traditional Linux companies like you know IBM and Intel, <coughs> Intel, but also uh, companies like JP Morgan uh, and uh, New Wave and type of blockchain companies like Digital Asset, um, basically to explore the the other end of the spectrum from Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency kind of space, which was the enterprise use of you could call them blockchain networks. Uh, you, uh, the more <coughs> uh, enterprise friendly term for them is uh, distributed ledger uh, networks, which think of it, yeah, as a shared multi-master database. Anybody can write to it. Um, everyone can validate transactions to it, and you can set the rules for what are valid transactions or not that are enforced by the network, um, and designed it in a way to be resistant to hostile actors so that you can have, start out with a very small number of nodes that are shared between a small community, um, but eventually you want to be able to grow that to encompass anybody who would have a role to play. Um, and four years in, the project has really taken off. The project has uh, passed the point, and I'd say we hit this last year, where um, you know, it, it, there are a bunch of promising ideas and hype and things like that and, and POCs, uh, but to the point really where you can talk about production value being created. You can talk about real assets on network. You could talk about billions of dollars uh, worth of uh, trade finance being financed today across uh, dozens of different trade finance networks using this platform. Or 20% uh, roughly of the diamond industry now tracking diamonds on top of uh, a Hyperledger-based network, the provenance of those diamonds, making sure they didn't come from uh, uh, blood diamonds types of sources or were used in to purchase weapons, those sorts of things. Um, uh, and, and really into this really big field uh, around uh, fixing digital identity across the internet, moving us away from login with Facebook, login with Twitter, uh, to a world where you have in your wallet credentials that you can prove the integrity of, um, but aren't rooted uh, or built, you know, uh, built in kind of the surveillance economy type of traditional mode, uh, but instead in a very self-sovereign type of mode. So um, lots and lots of activity, even during this pandemic, you know, this has certainly been a, a, a tough time for, for all of us. Uh, but but even, especially, I'd say, in this pandemic, there's a, a, a keen interest in seeing how these technologies can help be part of the pathway out. Um, uh, so so lots of exciting stuff happening, but just that's, that's, that's at the high level. Right. Now, when we talked about this last time, we had a little conversation that the current audience might need to understand as well, um, in that Hyperledger is not... Uh, prima facie a Bitcoin technology. It's a blockchain technology. And and the key difference is how you gain an entitlement to write into the database. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that choice that Hyperledger made and how that's working out in practice? Yeah. So uh, I, the, at the beginning, the flag was really planted pretty firmly uh, as the kind of the antithesis to the craziness of the of the cryptocurrency and ICO market by saying, OK, one way to build these distributed ledgers is in a very flat way, in a way that anybody can add a node to, is to force them to prove some unit of work that is tied to their um, participation on the network uh, uh, to try to fight what's called a civil attacks, where somebody could claim to be a thousand different people or a thousand different organizations have a thousand times the weight in the consensus mechanism uh, around what's the next valid transaction on the network, right? That's the key thing that these networks track is, is a sequence of transactions that build upon the last and everyone has to be valid. And that val valid means, you know, you're not transferring an asset you don't have uh, ownership on or you're not violating some of the rules that are established uh, on the network. Uh, and coming to consensus globally uh, around what's the next legal transaction um, has some really hard constraints, uh, not just, you know, and bandwidth and, and latency, but around the the, the speed of light, um, how quickly, how many thousands of transactions a second you can do. Um, uh, but there's also a lot of concern around um, the, the the lack of regulation, uh, the lack of uh, uh, um, uh, you, you, you could say would be um, not not so much control, but uh, um, uh, about the fact that these units of work tended to be units that consumed power, uh, and so you hear about these big um, you know mining farms for for Bitcoin and Ethereum that uh, consume consume gigawatts. And even if they're solar powered, right, even if they're powered by hydro or, or others, there's still a sense as an environmentalist 
there's got to be a better way to do this than just, you know, burning power uh, for for the, you know, for the thrill of it. Right. Um, uh, there's not they call it proof of work, but it's not really much work being done. It's just proving that you're equivalent to somebody else who owns a similar CPU. Um, uh, the other approach to building these networks is um, permissioned uh, based networks where you say, I've got a community of business partners. Um, that community might include government regulators. That community uh, probably includes and should include startups. Um, and the business world is full of these kinds of communities. And when they're done wrong, you know, you get into antitrust, you get into exclusionary practices, and that's that's that done wrong. When it's done right, that gets to, you know, projects like ISO, right, or, or, or standards organizations and, and, and the appropriate ways to regulate these markets so that you have that balance of efficiency and, and innovation and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and so permissioned blockchain networks are really built more on that idea where the participants run nodes on this network or maybe they pay a cloud provider to run a node. And that represents their, their stake. That represents their homestead on that, uh, on that network. Um, and just like with open source software, you don't actually have to pay people to have them be a part of your community sometimes. If you give them enough intrinsic value and enough intrinsic motivation, um, you know, unless this is incredibly burdensome as the CPU burning proof of work approach is, um, you know, companies large and small will run a node on the network to be a part of that transaction volume. So that's the basic idea behind permissioned. Now, I present these as two dichotomous ends of a spectrum, but there's actually um, uh, a whole lot of points in between these two, um, where some of the ideas coming out of the public blockchain space, um, partly around um, uh, scalability and how can you have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of nodes on one network, um, partly around confidentiality and privacy, since those public blockchains are public by default. They've had to more quickly try to answer questions around zero knowledge proofs and private information, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, 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 and really, you know, even if you're over here on the permission blockchain side, you want to open up uh, those communities as quickly as possible um, uh, so that you're really, you know, doing business with as many different parties as you can. Um, and so, so we have a lot of projects in Hyperledger that now explore kind of that middle ground between the two. Um, we added a, an Ethereum client uh, last year called Hyperledger Bezu, which is an implementation of the Ethereum standards and is actually usable on the public blockchain networks, uh, but is also designed to be used in these permissioned kinds of settings. Um, so lots of good conversations happening inside. We, we, we definitely are trying to avoid the the hype and the, uh, um, the bubble type of in the speculative financial kind of like side of the blockchain space and be much more about the prosaic. How do we all as a, as a, as a community come to an agreement on a common system of record um, and there's so many use cases for that so I, I think that was really the, the the thing that really struck me about hyperledger when it came out was that you were avoiding the uh, the ICO the, um, the 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 coin hype snake oil merchant stuff that uh, even though it could play a valid technical role in the distributed ledger would also incent people who have absolutely no interest in the distributed ledger to come in speculatively and basically screw the whole place up for everybody. Uh, and uh, do, do, do you feel that you've missed out by not having those people around or do you think that not having them around is a blessing? Uh, well, I've been close enough to the, that side of the community because I've always had an olive branch to them, and I've always tried to give due respect to the hard engineering work that's going on on that side. And they're and like everybody, right? You have stories of times when if you'd written a five or ten thousand dollar check, so to speak, or, or or purchased you know the right asset at the right time, which is sitting you there in, in front of your face, you'd you know be able to retire on a private island or something like that. Um, but uh, aside from that sense of commercial missing out, which if you've been in the tech sector for as long as all of us have, you have many. Of those stories. Um, I, no, I mean, we've really benefited from the fact that there are lots of developers out there who work for big companies who'd never be able to uh, work on those uh, on, on cryptocurrency technologies, um, who are, are, are focused on uh, government use cases, for example, uh, that where that sensitivity around, um, you know, is somebody owning this network? Is somebody ben uh, benefiting super linearly um, uh, from the value being created on this network, especially compared to everyone else? Um, uh, are real concerns. People do think about these policies issues long term and, and being able to kind of say that, you know, investment is possible. You can use this to track digital assets. You could even use these technologies to issue tokens if you really wanted to, but that the drive isn't about 
kind of a, uh, a crypto anarchist kind of like bring down the banks, bring down the regulators, bring down government kind of kind of point of view. But instead, how do we make those systems of the world more accountable? How do we make them? You know, we can't make them more fair, but how do we make them more transparent? Uh, how do we make it harder for fraud to perpetrate? Um, and then have the conversation about what are the right policies and the right way to map that up with human rights and all those types of issues. So, um, yeah, right. no, no, uh, no small debates uh, happening on our side. <laughs> So uh, the, the other uh, aspect of that crypto anarchy uh, um, uh, manifesto stuff was uh, the idea of having uh, automated contracts. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder, uh, is that a dimension now of Hyperledger or uh, yeah. are you strictly a distributed ledger? No, um, it's been an important part since day one uh, to uh, embed, you, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, the, the whole point of a ledger is to figure out what's the next valid transaction. And the next valid transaction is not simply the first thing that the network heard and was able to confirm. Um, it might be, you know, you can you can write this, but only if these other conditions are met or automatically, if these other conditions are met, everybody at a certain time on a network or enough people, you know, run a run a script. And if that script output comes to agreement across the network, then you write a new transaction, right? So that actually has tremendous amounts of value, even in these permission blockchain settings where you want to reduce what's called counterparty risk in the execution of something like uh, a financial instrument, a mortgage, or uh, uh, you want to make sure when a company issues profits that those are actually being distributed fairly. I mean, um, there's all sorts of places where the automation that is allowed by these, I mean, it's very similar to right embedded uh, programming inside of databases, right? It's a way to enforce it at a layer that can't be worked around by the people who build the applications above. So um, uh, super important. Uh, what I, I'd say we differ on um, is is, you know, at least me personally, I'm not a huge fan of this concept of the distributed autonomous organization that you could incorporate a company essentially as a set of smart contracts that would run completely on its own uh, in a way that would not be correctable or, or um, uh, in the minds of any defraudable by humans uh, uh, or corruptible by humans. But also uh, if there's a bug and someone figures out how to steal $150 million of assets as has happened, um, that that's the adjust and right outcome. Right. So um, I think I think what what we're really seeing with permission blockchain networks is a way to make, keep the humans in charge so that if there is a bug there's a way to correct for that um if we want to evolve the platform in some some disruptive way we can do that um and 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 kind of still depends upon human governance which i think is even there on the cryptocurrency networks they just kind of deny it um uh but here there's kind of an explicit call out for that but that still means doesn't mean there isn't a role for the automated governance and the automated uh processing that comes from smart contracts right so in, in the end, uh, where Hyperledger has got to now, what would you say was your, your favorite project that is using Hyperledger? What is the, 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 the use case we should all go and look at and be wowed by? Um, and be wowed by. I mean, to some degree, like uh, that's that is a, a high barrier, right? Um, uh, and and every single example that you'll be able to see. And by the way, there's case studies and 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 a, and a production kind of showcase and other things on the Hyperledger website that show you know examples like the ones I've mentioned and digital identity uh, to uh, its use in other government kinds of functions. And uh, a lot of them might feel kind of boring because they are about all of us coming to a, a, a agreement on a system of record. Um, uh, and I, I remember, I think on this show three years ago saying part of my job is to make blockchain boring. So I think in some ways I've succeeded. Um, uh, but uh, every single example you'll ever see in both that we talk about and, and, and others, um, you'll always be able to come back and say, well, couldn't I have done that with a centralized repository? Couldn't I have done that with a central server? Uh, and won't that actually be cheaper to launch and faster and all that stuff? And the answer will always be yes. Uh, it'll always be possible to take these apps and run them as a central server, just as we could have designed a Bitcoin.com and had it run centrally, right? Uh, uh, put it up on a bunch of AWS large instances and away it would have gone. Um, uh, but the reality is that these in these use cases, there's an embedded trust issue. You know, there's trust in uh, issues in trade finance. Um, there isn't like one organization or one country everyone trusts to keep everyone's systems of account and, and a trade finance network uh, clear. So use a distributed ledger to keep that clear. And examples like that from the outside side might be difficult to understand. Another example is um, something Honeywell built, which is a marketplace for used airline parts. Um, before 
hearing about this, I didn't quite realize that the typical airline part is used in four different air, uh, airplanes over the course of its lifespan. Um, uh, uh, kind of uh, sobering thought as you get on a plane. Um, but uh, they built this large uh, network to do um, uh, basically the same thing you might have built in eBay to do or, or, or another kind of double-sided marketplace with somebody at the center. But they did that for an industry that is very paranoid about platforms and very paranoid about centers of control. And so as a distributed ledger network, uh, it gives everybody a copy of the ledger, a copy of the history, and the ability to move forward if they they reach some disagreement about how the system should be operated and avoid somebody acting as kind of a rent seeker at the center of that of that network. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's that's one thing to keep in mind is looking while you're looking at these examples. Well, I have more questions, but first, uh, I I want to bring in a word from uh, uh, from ExpressVPN, which is another sponsor for our show. Um, ExpressVPN is is um, one of the one of the one of the great great uh, uh, VPNs out there. And one of the cool things it does is it lets you access the internet as if you're in a different country. Uh, Netflix, for example, has different shows and movies available depending on where you are in the world, and you can unlock thousands of new shows and movies from streaming libraries that are distributed differently around the globe. There are hundreds of VPNs out there, but ExpressVPN is ridiculously fast. You can stream everything in HD quality with zero buffering. It's available on every device, phones, laptops, tablets, even your TV. It works with many streaming services, Netflix, Amazon Prime, BBC iPlayer, YouTube, and many more. You can choose from almost 100 different countries uh, to relocate yourself virtually around the world. And it's very simple to use. Just fire up the ExpressVPN app, change your location, hit connect, and then refresh the page to... And the show or the movie that you want to watch will magically appear. Um, you know, for example, you know, you want to watch Star Trek uh, Discovery or Black Adder. You can do that at Netflix UK, Brooklyn Nine-Nine on Netflix Canada, Rick and Morty on Netflix France, French Prince of, Prince of Bel-Air on Netflix Australia or How I Met Your Mother on Netflix Germany. Uh, my own preference uh, is to just use it for research. I love to be in different countries and see how the different laws regarding privacy play out. I'm, I'm a big researcher. So that's my primary use for uh, an ExpressVPN. So uh, if you use my link right now at expressvpn.com slash floss, you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free with a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash floss. So the, I, I'm, I, I want to digress a bit further on the, the Linux Foundation itself, uh, because I think it's a fascinating organization. As I understand it, over half, over half of the Global 2000 belong to the Linux Foundation. And um, we all go back far enough so that, I mean, when we started Linux Journal back in 1994, and even well into this millennium, um, Linux was this, you know, cadre of, 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 of a radical sort of, you know, that we're coding away and now the world runs on it. And, and it seems to me that the Linux foundation is, is not only doing something very new as an organization, it's actually modeling a completely new way for an organization to work. I mean, especially with b helping big companies get along and collaborate on, on stuff that saves them uh, you know, on, I guess, non-recurring engineering costs and things like that. So if you want to fill us in a little bit more on that as far as you feel comfortable. Yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, its origin story is not quite when uh, Linus released the kernel in 1991, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but really more around 2002, 2003, when um, companies like IBM started to run Super Bowl ads talking about uh, uh, the, this new thing called Linux. Uh, and, and you started to see companies, I think it was 2000, actually, and I think about it, when VA Linux went public with the LNUX stock, stock uh, ticker symbol, right? Um, and, and that was a, a point in time when there were a lot of questions 
about what is the future of this project? I, I, it's how, you know, what's the relationship between it and Linus Torvalds himself? What happens if he gets hit by a bus, right? Or gets employed by Microsoft, which we were all worried about at the time, right? Um, uh, and, I, I, you know, and how do we help make sure that there's kind of a, uh, enough coordination between the companies that are building on top of this that they don't, none of them is tempted to try to run away and claim to be the Linux company, right? Um, uh, or, or really drain what uh, is, was it and still is a very broad based kind of movement um, I, just because they own a trademark or just because they, you know, who they employ or, or whatever. Um, and so it started out, you know, actually with a lot of history of the Linux standard space um, and and um, open source labs, I think might have been its first proto name before it properly became the foundation. But the, the sense was, you know, you could sit around hoping for donations uh, from individuals and uh, that's a really hard road. It works in some cases and, and uh, some organizations are able to pay for essentials from that, like the Apache Software Foundation. Um, but, uh, I, I, you know, there was a sense that it might not be enough to, to actually um, uh, keep people aligned and, and keep people moving in, in, in a way that handles not the programming effort, but all the other stuff beyond the programming. Um, I think it's also been pretty important uh, for for the Linux Foundation that it not pay for the software development. Um, I well, one software development is expensive. It's really hard to put a price on the value of what's being created by an open source community. Um, it also is kind of awkward if there's a few people on the project who are being paid by the same governance organization that's trying to keep the rules fair, because arguably then their patches, their contributions might be given much more weight uh, in in what you still want to run as a very community driven process as a still very open open uh, uh, and and meritocratic kind of process um, so, so so that's that's meant that the you really don't want that funding to, to corrupt that you want to make sure that everything you do is out in the open and then the template to build upon with traditional like standards bodies was problematic partly because those standards bodies were only accessible to the companies that could pay um, you really didn't want to create a gate where those companies who were members were the only ones who had access or the ability to change the code um, or, or, you know and they weren't forced to kind of stand up and make sure that the you know changes they wanted to see were the right ones, those sorts of things. So there's been a delicate balancing act. How do you provide enough value to companies that are members uh, who are uh, both for the whole of the Linux Foundation and on these individual projects? Um, to uh, uh, be able to justify it, especially at a time like now when budgets are being cut and and people are really you know trying to um, save every dollar and, and are uncertain about the future, right? Um, uh, and that's come in the form of doing events, doing certifications and training, of uh, trying to 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 meet with those uh, members to think about what are the next waves of projects to start to bring in, um, and doing some behind the scenes coordination sometimes on that. Uh, you know, an, an example of this is you know at the beginning of this year a bunch of people woke up and realized that there might be a role for open source to play in the response to the pandemic in a number of different ways. But one of the ones that seemed most urgent was as a complement to the contact tracing uh, space and, and particularly the um, apps that are uh, being rolled out now to do exposure notification. And so uh, Dan Kahn, who is kind of my equivalent over on the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, just started engaging with members, talking to experts, trying to figure out what's what's really um, needed here uh, to address the security issues and the privacy issues people have with uh, and valid concerns they have with apps that track their location and 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 such um, with where the standards were heading with Google and Apple uh, where the uh, public health authorities were and so we did a lot of work behind the scenes to put together something that launched last um, month as the Linux Foundation Public Health Initiative um, which it, well, it's not the first time we've engaged with governments um, and government officials uh, we've done that around let's encrypt uh, and uh, CC, CI the core infrastructure initiative before. But this is the first time where the expected customers of that project are public health authorities and where we engage with uh, companies to help get the code built, but also do that last mile of deployment to those end users, because um, not many public health authorities are going to be able to just pull down open source code and deploy it right um, by themselves. Uh, so um, that's launched. That's been pretty successful. It is now things uh, um, the standard app in I Ireland, uh, a different code base, but also part of LFPH is the standard one for Canada. Uh, Pennsylvania just announced they're adopting it. I know that there's about a dozen states uh, and a dozen more countries evaluating uh, uh, these code bases for their national uh, exposure notification approaches. Um, part of Ireland uh, actually is thankful is uh, due to, thanks are due to Nearform uh, and Denise Cooper and Sienna Madden and, and the others there who are really big open source advocates. Um, so uh, so anyway, so we see branching into these other domains where. 
trust in technology is important. We're coordinating vendors so that no one tries to run away and become like an irreplaceable rent seeking platform at the center of that is important. Um, and, uh, and it started with operating systems 20 years ago, but, but it's really in all these different domains now. Right. So it's quite interesting looking there, Brian, because you're, uh, you know, you're famously the, one of the founders of the Apache Software Foundation, which is the, the ultimate, uh, uh, meritocratic, um, uh, staffless organization. It does have a few staff, but you know, basically it's a, a, an entirely virtual organization. Uh, you're also uh, on the board at Mozilla, which is the ultimate employ everybody who ever touched our code organization. Mm -hmm. And your staff at the Linux Foundation, which is uh, somewhere in between the two, a, a big budget, uh, corporate uh, loving organization that employs a whole load of programmers, but also coordinates the pseudo standards activities of its members. So looking across that entire spectrum, which do you think is truest to the original open source vision? Um, which is the best sign of the corruption of the movement? Sorry, Doug, you going to say something? No, no. <laughs> okay. I just thought it Clear was a wild corruption. Well, <laughs> did you want me to raise my Go hand over the most corrupt? Uh, <laughs> no, no, you can. You don't actually have to point out the most corrupt one. You can just tell us which is the <laughs> truest. Which of your children do you hate think, most? I mean, it's like <laughs> well, no, I don't think any of those three are corrupt in in in, in any of the ways that matter uh, on the ground in open source. Right. Nor do I think um, uh, you know they're 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 part of the, the problem here, but. Um, they are very different organizations, and uh, it it is interesting how these tribes kind of form over time. And you could say that some, in some degree, the, the structure is reflective of the needs, uh, sector by sector or, or code by code. Um, uh, for example, uh, it was pretty clear at the beginning of the the at right at the time when Mozilla was um, uh, you know kind of emerging out of AOL. If you remember that that history, um, AOL didn't care about having it anymore as a hedge against Microsoft. So um, they were ready to cut it loose and let go of the 20 people who were left after AOL had bought Netscape. Um, it was pretty clear at the time that even if you were able to pay 20 people full time on a, on a web browser project, that would still just barely be keeping up with bug reports, uh, you know, because you've got hundreds of millions of users out there, um, I, you know, let alone keeping up with well-funded teams at Microsoft or, or other places. Right. Um, and so that, that, you know, that it was initially a first, like, are we going to be able to survive on volunteer efforts, on don donations from corporations, that sort of thing. And to be honest, we kind of stumbled into at the Mozilla Foundation into two things. One was a, a reinvention of the underlying code base, uh, which became Firefox, um, throwing away a lot of legacy and a, a lot of cruft and saying, no, pr performance matters, security matters. Just, you know, forget uh, Adobe Flash, you know, those sorts of things. Um, uh, and then the second was somebody realized that, oh, the search engines out there that are starting to emerge in 2002, whatever, will actually pay you for traffic. And uh, there's a, a plausible and never perfect, but, but at least a reasonable argument to say that that's not either favoring one company because you can do it across the multiple or uh, a violation of privacy. And so that turned out to generate a lot more income than anyone probably would have guessed, um, <clears throat> which eventually became, <laughs> you know, I think at its peak in the 300, $350 million a year uh, type of range, um, which was lucky because that was about as much as you needed to employ a thousand <laughs> engineers um, to be able to keep up, especially once Google jumped in with Chrome, especially once Microsoft woke up again and started building its browser. So I don't know that you could have uh, made a uh, competitive web browser uh, in that space to try to fight for the open web <clears throat> without the model that Mozilla had. I don't think uh, even the Linux Foundation's model would have worked there because we're we're better suited to those technologies where there's a broad industry need, where um, there's, uh, you know, um, I mean, Firefox is one product. You kind of don't want 20 Firefoxes out there, but you might want 20 distributions of Hyperledger Fabric. In fact, the, the fact that Hyperledger Fabric is customized and now supported as a blockchain as a service offering from AWS and Azure and uh, Google Cloud and IBM and all the clouds in China is actually a, a key, important and valuable and useful thing. You wouldn't have wanted that for Firefox, I don't think, right? Mm -hmm. But to another degree, that revenue stream kind of became addic uh, you know, addictive in some way, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that you took on new projects. You know, Mozilla took on lots of projects around expanding the open web, um, uh, so has supported Thunderbird for a long time, even now that Thunderbird's a separate organization, um, helped 
provide, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year in funding for academic support and Mozilla fellows and all the work the foundation does. So, um, it is one kind of model and it, it could be accident of history. It could be the difference between a web browser and frankly, a web server. Um, web servers are relatively easy to code. Uh, uh, trust me, if I can contribute a patch to it, it's gotta be simple. Um, <laughs> I, I, cause I was never a very good programmer. Um, I, and I, I, you know, and, and, and Apache worked better again, partly by historical accident, but worked really well for these components that were intended to be very tightly tied to standards intended to be, um, super lightweight, Although one would argue open office, uh, was kind of more to digest than, than Apache yeah, could yeah. handle. In fact, that might even be a lesson where, you know, perhaps the Mozilla approach to something like open office might've been better. Um, uh, or, uh, I don't know if a Linux foundation approach would have worked, but, um, but these are three tools in a toolkit. It's like a hammer, a wrench and a, and a screwdriver. Um, you could use any, <laughs> you could pound that nail in with the wrench if you really wanted to, but, um, why not have all three as options? Yeah, yeah. Well, we 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 uh, what we actually did with uh, Open Office when the community didn't go to Apache was start a foundation and um, run something very uh, Mozilla-like with very Apache-type rules. Uh, yeah. uh, but the one of the interesting things that's recently happened has been Thunderbird coming back to Mozilla again, and uh, they seem to be entirely funded now by user donations, which I find fascinating. Do you think that's going to play a larger role in the future of open source and free software? Well, Thunderbird has always been, um, you know, and just in a moment of self-honesty or reflection, because this has been, you know, a, a subject of conversation at the foundation and corporation boards for, for quite a while. And we are separate boards between the foundation and corporation. Um, I, I has kind of been the redheaded stepchild for Mozilla for, for too long. Um, and I, I, it has, uh, you know, there's lots of people who are kind of, you know, oh, Gmail and web-based email and stuff. It's the future. We don't want to spend time on it. But there's a core user community around Thunderbird uh, of about 50 15 to 20 million um, at, that we know of. And it might be that the telemetry is off because people shut it off or whatever, but um, but potentially much larger than that, um, uh, who uh, use it every day. I use it every day for my mail. I won't use Gmail just for, for user experience kinds of reasons. Um, actually, half my mail is Thunderbird, half of it is Alpine, um, I, I, which is the text-based kind of Linux, Linux client, which I got into 25 years ago, can't give up. Um, but Thunderbird has this very active uh, user community and volunteer developer community. Um, um, and because Mozilla didn't have a commercialization model for it, they were able to kind of at best keep it on live support. Uh, and what emerged uh, has been, you know, by supporting this community, right? And and that that user community hasn't gone away. The developer community has only strengthened. And uh, and the revenue last year, uh, by the way, it, could, it was always a Mozilla Foundation supported project. It just wasn't funded uh, in the terms of having paid developers. Um, but in terms of having a home within Mozilla, it was really important to keep that keep that close in. Um, and then last year, um, before the pandemic, before all that, we kind of realized that the, the donations coming in, the volunteer donations coming in to, from Thunderbird users to support what has now become uh, a set of eight paid staff, uh, eight or nine, I forget exactly, um, was it was actually large enough that it threatened the nonprofit status of the Mozilla Foundation um, because it was for an unrelated purpose. Um, so it was spun out into its own subsidiary, the same way that MoCo is a subsidiary called MZLA Technologies. Um, and and I, I, I'm on the board of that along with Mark Sermon uh, and Angie uh, Plowman from the foundation. But the project is really run by the, the, the contributors and by something called the Thunderbird Council. Um, and they are trying to look for what are some other commercialization opportunities here? Is it selling enterprise services? Is it um, perhaps running, running mail servers or something like that, running accounts for people? Um, nothing is very clear on that front. The, the most important thing is supporting what is still a very active active community um, and channeling that effort into the right kinds of QA processes and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. um, uh, and, and uh, they've spent a lot of time paying off technical debt in the Thunderbird code base, which has been really great to see. Um, it's it, it's running on the latest kind of same stack as Firefox is. So, and it matches Firefox version number for version number. So release 76 or 78 just came out and 80 is been really being worked on again, very closely tied to Firefox development. And that'll continue, uh, right. you know, and that is completely unaffected, actually, by the recent reduction in force uh, that you saw at Mozilla Corporation. Yes, absolutely. I, I, well, that's that's really the reason for raising the question is because, uh, you know, Thunderbird, because it is self-funded by its users, uh, is insulated from the market-driven uh, shrinkage or expansion as it varies of, of Mozilla Corporation. 
And so, it, you know, it's, it could be a, a good proposition for software that, frankly, you can't make a profit from doing it in a proprietary way. That's what the LibreOffice and OpenOffice communities have found, is that uh, corporations don't want to do uh, office suites anymore. Uh, it's simply not attractive to them. Uh, and it, I, I think that user-funded model is what's driving uh, the Document Foundation, and it's what's driving uh, Thunderbird. Uh, so I, I wonder whether that, that could be the future of the, uh, the open source desktop in some way. Well, I'm sitting here using uh, uh, Ubuntu and GNOME and you know Thunderbird and Quodlibet, uh, but we are talking through Skype, of course. So uh, you know, there's counterexamples, but um, I don't I don't know that any one direction is more necessarily more virtuous than another or guaranteed to succeed over the other. I think um, the larger factor is the leadership. The people involved and where their sentiments are, and that's uh, and and the developer community that forms, you know, especially if they're around a project for five or ten years uh, or longer, they start to have really vested emotions uh, and really vested ways of working that um, they've gotten very comfortable with, and might right. provide a lot of productivity, um, but but also might make it hard for new voices to come in. I think this is something Apache has really wrestled with for the right. last five years. You and I have seen the the conversations on the members list is that. Absolutely Clash, constant you know. questions about it. And, you know, yeah. related back to that open office project as well, which is, uh, you know, there's the, 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 the touchstone that's helping Apache understand where its boundaries are. It, it yeah. turned out it wasn't size, it was to do with function. And I'm watching mm -hmm. the NetBeans project going through, you know, I'm on the PMC of the NetBeans project, and I'm watching NetBeans going through similar growing pains. I'm seeing on the Apache legal lists all sorts of projects uh, struggling with how to do the things they have to do in the market. Uh, which are all uh, increasingly user user or device facing. So uh, you know, I think we've. Do, do you do you feel that a, that the, the Apache's biggest problem is size or or, or function in that way? Um, uh, complexity kills, and mm -hmm. and I worry sometimes. I feel I feel like for one, it, I, I'm not sure I deserve to to have like a, an incredibly well founded point of view on this. Just I, I'm a passive observer on this. Um, it was uh, I started to peel away from Apache uh, around 2003 and four, partly because I felt that it deserved a, a full time paid executive director and some staff to help manage a lot of the issues that it was depending upon volunteers for, like filing tax returns, you know, uh, and uh, um, and and other. I, I know that I know the ASF pays for, you know, Sally Kuderi for, for PR support, which is great. It pays for legal services and some other things. Um, now they do, certainly. At that time, it was a harder case to make that that leadership mattered. Um, and I think you need paid staff to manage complexity for you um, as a volunteer organization. Um, I don't think you need any paid staff up to, you know, it was a Dunbar's number of 150 participants, yep. right? Um, uh, or you can get away with volunteer staff. But once you're really vested and active, daily engaged community of, of contributors and core main core contributors and such is, uh, is outside Dunbar's number, I struggle to see how you scale without having somebody who wakes up every day being paid to to think about this. Um, I mean, one of the biggest criticisms of Apache's model is that it, because it's so dependent upon volunteerism, it really depends upon people who are distinguished engineers uh, or semi-retired uh, or otherwise acting very much out of their own kind of needs and interests and is very vulnerable when something like the pandemic hits and everyone's suddenly much more stressed uh, or just even on an individual basis if somebody has to, you know, can't afford to spend 20 hours a week on what is being, you know, described as volunteer work when, you know, uh, the, the needs of their family or, or immediate communities are, are, are very strong. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think that's one of the struggles is complexity more than anything else and legacy. And I think if some of the old timers on Apache were a bit more willing to let go of, of, um, the way things have always been done or, or an over romanticized attachment to, uh, to that, um, it might, open up some energy from new contributors in a way that that you know it right now dampens i'd like to ask if you have any thoughts about the uh, the fracturing of the web and of the net underneath it um there's uh um lately they're calling it the splinter net where china in particular is saying we're we've got our own we've got our own it's censored too bad if you don't like it we're operating this over here um to some degree, maybe exporting that um, Europe becoming the regulated net and uh, uh, and becoming much more privacy oriented. Um, I was talking yesterday to one of the bigs, uh, somebody at one of the bigs, where 
um, a new law in one of the countries is going to require that in order to, for example, view a video, you're going to have to get proof of somebody's age. I mean, really hard proof, um, meaning that in, and, and, and that's, you know, and, and here in the U.S. is still sort of wild and free, except in California, we've got the CCPA. But it, there's sort of a, a something happening there. And I'm wondering what you, if you have any thoughts about it since you're in the middle of so much so much stuff or if it's just uh, a third rail I'd rather not go to. Yeah, well, I mean, Doc, I've been a part of your the, your, your VRM uh, mailing list <laughs> yeah, project for forever, and and we've tracked kind of the collapse in trust in technologists in general in Silicon Valley in particular. You know, there used to be this default reservoir of trust that the public had that was built up from the time when you know the Silicon Valley was about desktop publishing and empowerment. You know, we'll make everybody Gutenberg. Um, I will you know make everyone smarter through HyperCard. I mean, there was like an enabling kind of constructivist kind of kind of frame that all that, that I think all three of us kind of grew up in around technology as a as an unalloyed good and where connecting two people or connecting the world and cutting the cost of communication to zero and the death of distance was all a, you know uh, uh, an unmitigated good right like that of course that's a social good of course that's a, a public benefit how could it not be um and uh, and and you know I think uh, and and we and all other people have been worried about the splinter net and the rise of this ever since China introduced the first great firewall right um uh, uh, you know, and 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 I so I'm on the board of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We clearly have a position that you know the fight for digital rights is synonymous with the fight for human rights. Um, that civil liberties uh, have a role to play in um, you know, how these services evolve, and and it's important to understand the underlying protocols and infrastructure to make sure that they reinforce that, um, and uh, uh, and also to fight bad laws and laws that um, you know are, are are going to harm you know, not just innovation but the exercise of civil liberties. Um, uh, but the whole world doesn't necessarily share those same points of view, right? Uh, and um, I think we've found that there are bad actors out there who will exploit that openness. Um, and and I mean, across the board, I don't mean to characterize them uh, uh, one way or the other, but bad actors who exploit that openness to do harm, right? Um, and you uh, and 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 the network was never uh, the internet was never completely ungoverned. You've had institutions like ICANN and others that have traditionally had this very light touch, um, and and that's been appropriate and, and important. But it's also uh, run up against the cold hard uh, kind of uh, uh, sentiment out there especially outside of California, our bubble here and on this call, um, that, you know, the, these harms are deep and pervasive and difficult to counter if you're not uh, counting them at a technology layer. Um, I'm still an optimist. I'm still a globalist. Um, one of the our big uh, one of the big things I focused on at Hyperledger was making sure that the technologies being built there were not uh, exclusively U.S. centric or, or Western Europe centric, but were seen as global technologies because so many of these use cases, uh, trade finance, supply chain, chain traceability, uh, you know, go into, you know, cross borders and need to involve Asia. Um, so from the first time I was hired, I made about four or five trips a year uh, to China in particular uh, and um, equivalent amounts of trips to other parts of Asia um, to try to help them understand how to be a part of the project that they can use these technologies. And actually right now, Hyperledger Fabric is the most widely used blockchain platform inside of China. In fact, China just launched something called the Blockchain Services Network, which is a kind of a government funded and created a uh, network of nodes across like 40 or 50 different cities and 40 or 50 different companies um, to build kind of a common thing of it as like a national highway grid for the deployment of enterprise blockchain apps. And there's two technologies that underpin that Hyperledger Fabric and um, uh, something from, from WeBank uh, called uh, Fisco, um, which is kind of a more proprietary kind of China specific one. Um, and so that I think is pretty important important uh, so that we don't, at least at the open source level, at the at the infrastructure layer, at the protocol layer, end up with a really fractured internet. Um, and it's been really gratifying to see uh, Apache spend a lot of time as well focusing on uh, contributors in China uh, and giving them first class status in that um, to see now we actually, I mean, 10, 20 years ago, even our software, the software was not double byte. It was not internationalized or localized. Now it seems like if, if you're a mature project at all, you have translated docs, you have Unicode support 
support everywhere that's important. So I feel like we're in a lot better spot, at least at the underlying infrastructure layer, to um, make sure that these forces that do seek to divide uh, uh, don't end up fracturing the underlying protocols. Uh, but you can't kind of deny a country its right to to say, you know, we're going to put a block at, the, at our border. Um, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's it's uh, a good idea from uh, all sorts of perspectives. But uh, it, it, if you believe in democracy, you believe in like self-determination by by citizens, you kind of have to give that to them, right? Um, our hope ultimately is that, you know, uh, there's enough kind of subversive elements, you know, Signal and Tor and those sorts of things that uh, uh, those blocks can't, you know, will never be, you know, hard, right? They'll be permeable. Um, and and there's always then an opportunity to, to, to shift the culture inside those countries um, uh, to to one that is able to tolerate a bit more of that of that sharing. But um, uh, but but we as technologists have a, a really it's really important for us to think about the human rights implications of what we're building. Um, one of the other communities I, I, I help out on is something called ID2020, which is a group formed to, to look at digital identity initiatives at nation scale levels, things like India's Aadhaar system and ones especially used in refugee types of environments and make sure that those systems meet a very high bar for privacy and confidentiality and, and essentially the sovereignty of the data uh, that is uh, being kind of managed by those systems and make sure that government bureaucrats can't just disappear someone's identity, can't um, refute that they you know, ever issued a, a, you know, a, a passport in the first place or an identity card in the first place. Um, and I think these kinds of initiatives are really important for technologists to understand, be involved in, and make sure that when they're building things at low levels, that they're being as as uh, uh, thoughtful about how these technologies might be misused as they can be. Um, but you can't ultimately prevent uh, people uh, at higher levels from doing the wrong things with your technology. The best you can do is to try to make it hard for the wrong things to happen and to make it transparent when they do. Well, there's so much to cover here. I, um, anyway, one of the things, and, and we probably don't have time for this, but it's it's uh, it's just come up for me in the last several days that um, big companies wanting to do the right thing and also feeling the responsibility of being the ones who might be, be able to do the only thing, you know. I'll, I'll take I'll take the example of one that that wasn't on the table for me, which is Amazon Web Services. Like an enormous amount of the world right now runs on AWS, and they have a responsibility there, and 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 they're doing something that only giants can do. Um, but at the same time, we need room for the for the, you know, for the subversives, like you were just saying, you know, and, and, but to me, it comes down to this weird tug of war between what only the bigs can do, what only a big organization can do, and what only individuals can do. And I feel like the latter gets lost, even though if it weren't for an individual in, 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 in the case of Linux, in the case of Apache, in the case of many of these things, just, you know, scratching their own itches, they say, we wouldn't have things that are are the world's infrastructure today. And, and yet that doesn't get the credit. I mean, we don't, it, it's like, we still don't see the knee. It, and I'm talking about the, we in a very general sense, but, uh, but anyway, run with it. Yeah. <laughs> and well, we're I short think, on um, time. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, really quick on that. I mean, uh, um, I remember 20 years ago with CollabNet, the company that I started then, um, feeling like, you know, in every setting like that, you might not be able to convince a market leader to open source a technology that's their core business, their secret sauce. But typically you can convince uh, companies two through N <laughs> to collaborate <laughs> on, a, on, on, a, on, on a technology platform that potentially threatens the first one, right? Not in an antitrust sense, but just in a sense of market control and, and, and platform control sense. Right. And it turns out that's a pretty repeatable pattern. I mean, in, in the Linux Foundation, I think that's really been the heart of it is figuring out, you know, for each of these domains we could go into, is there a critical mass of companies willing to fund the air traffic control necessary to make a project in that space work? Um, and you never assume that there's just people out there who are certainly not out of an act of charity will want to see more open source software do X. But if you if you scope it just right, engineer the the, the politics just right and the personalities, um, uh, there's a a lot of domains of technology that uh, the LF could go into with the model that it has, um, and and proactively. So so we're get, we're getting down toward the the end of the hour. Um, I, but uh, yeah, we, we've we've four questions we generally tend to close with, and uh, I'll ask the first one, hoping that you can make it 
really brief, which is, are there any questions we haven't asked that you'd like us to have asked because we missed it? No, I mean, uh, I, I've, I've <laughs> given long answers, so I probably kept you from asking questions you wanted to ask. So but let's go. On a back I was down. saying you're you're one of those people that you can't listen to with, on a podcast at 1.5x or 2x. <laughs> might actually turn it down to half x or something like that. <laughs> That's one thing I love about podcasts. Um, so um, – You've actually taught, we always ask about blockchain, but you said so much about blockchain already. You've probably already answered that one. So I'll go to the next one, which is, um, what's your favorite text editor and scripting language? <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I grew up in Emacs more than VI. Uh, these days, you know, probably use Nano when I need to, to modify something on a command line, uh, just because it's more often there than than Emacs, because pulling in packages for Emacs is a total bear on a on a on a clean system. Um, so I, I, it's one of those three. I find I don't really uh, think well inside of like a Google Doc uh, kind of kind of setting. Uh, um, I kind of need I need a terminal window. For some reason, I'm just I, it's more flexible and, and tools like Emacs and, and, and Nano. I know the key bindings well. So, yeah, old school on that. How many? How many not so old school as to say VI or Ed how many or terminal windows or command lines do you have open at a given time? Seven right here on this <laughs> desktop um, and to five different systems. I'm not a That's programmer, but I just other questions you know, we need to ask. <laughs> I still run my own mail server, things like that. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, this is this has been fantastic. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, we'll have to have you back soon. We said that to everybody, but in your case, there's uh, we we love having you back. So, so thanks, thanks, thanks for being on with us. Oh, that's very sweet. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, Simon, um, how how'd that go for you? And there, there's so all, much all, to cover. All here. fasting. Uh, Pleasantly reflective, you know. I, I'm uh, here. I am over in the UK asking the uh, the, the tabloid questions, and, and Brian very very graciously uh, handling them. Uh, I, I, I would love to hear more of that on Floss Weekly. Honestly, is to uh, to dig into the the uh, the great minds of the web and the internet and work out uh, what they think about where we've been and where we're going. Uh, Hyperledger, I find fascinating to see how they're gradually creating a really boring technology that is going to be at the heart <laughs> of everything that you touch on the internet and uh, out of a space that was um, uh, utterly explosive and toxic when they came into it. And uh, honestly, is still uh, pretty explosive and toxic uh, if you go look at the the uh, cryptocurrency side of the world. So all, all around lots of fun. I just wish we could have had an extra half an hour, honestly, uh, Doc. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I actually have always loved the way uh, how how um, reflective and appreciative Brian is of of many angles, many points of view. I remember that we were at a an O'Reilly thing a thousand years ago, sometime in the last millennium, I guess. Um, we were, it was at a, a moment when a lot of us, by you know, were saying open source is going to be everything, and and Brian was saying no, we're never going to lose closed source. We're going to have both, right? And it's going to be you know, we're advocating on this side, but that side isn't even a side. It's just another part of the larger world. It's not going away. Um, <laughs> you may want to jump in and contradict me on that, but it's it's uh, it's 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 great having him on here. So, what are um, do, do you have anything to uh, to, to plug in these? At, at this stage, uh, only the usual stuff, you know. I, I uh, if you're watching on the video, uh, you'll see my yeah. website down below there. Um, you'll find me on Twitter as Webmink. You'll find me on uh, GitHub sponsors as Webmink. You'll find me in all sorts of places as Webmink. Uh, I, I'm not going out much at the moment. Uh, I, I don't know about you, Doc, but uh, uh, not not really getting to I mean, go to. Anything much? Yeah, we, we, we have a, <laughs> a, literally, it's it's brutally hot outside right now, so d d nobody goes out. Uh, d d we found out today we have to return our borrowed car and, and rent one. <laughs> so, huh? but if we're at a, we're at a stage in 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 life, or just in this pandemic, when even having a car is weird, you know. Um, uh, but, uh, but I want you to unpack your shirt for us, okay? You invented email. <laughs> uh, my my yeah, so nothing. Yeah, I, I, so I'm going to try and avoid getting Leo into any trouble here. Uh, there is a guy <laughs> who uh, goes around claiming that he invented email. Oh, right. And yeah. uh, uh, somebody who uh, I respect a great deal as a journalist, uh, Mike Masnick at TechDirt, 
wrote the perfect analysis of the situation, uh, telling everything factually and with with supporting evidence. And uh, he got sued for defamation by this guy and started a crowdfunder to pay for his lawsuit. And so I bought this T-shirt uh, to support oh, uh, huh. Mike Masnick's crowdfunder to defend himself against the, uh, the, the specious lawsuit from somebody who claimed that he invented email. When, honestly, Doc, uh, people your age and my age, we all invented email because it's something <laughs> that came organically out of the plaster work of the, of the walls of the buildings we were sitting yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, was, I, I wonder who, who did the RFP for... SMTP and POP3 and IMAP, you should probably look back at those because those are probably the real original authors uh, who submitted those uh, th to the IETF a thousand years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't look at the, I didn't know if any of the, any of the, anybody on the back channel had a question. I kind of regret not looking there, but they, they anyway. you know, the, uh, the, ch the chat room today has been, um, has been talking about pretty much everything except the show, I think, haven't you? Uh, yeah, 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 I, I think that's, that's true. That's true. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I I actually have a T-shirt story, which is that I um, just before we came on, I had a T-shirt I was going to wear that I realized at the last minute actually had the name of the this should never be on the Internet outfit that <laughs> that that I got the T-shirt from is one of those where, uh, you know, uh, Chatham House rules and all that. No, this is a thing that we never want to see on the Internet. And I thought, oh, my God, there it is. And I better take this off. So and I put on one of my black shirts, which uh, that don't work as well on camera. But but what the heck? This has been great. So. And I don't I, who we have on next week or not. We've been shifting people around. Um, uh, right now, it looks like Rebecca Whitworth, for the Red Hat and Trusty AI. So that's uh, that's in the queue. Well, thanks so much. This has been great. Um, so thanks for another week of Floss Weekly, and uh, and we'll see you next week. Want more Twit? Well, check out Smart Tech today. It's at twit.tv slash STT. It's the show where Matthew Casanelli and I cover everything there is to know about smart tech. It's automation. It's connected devices. It's smart home. It's all those goodies and so much more. We get the news. We get the latest devices. We do reviews. Everything. You got to check it out. Twit.tv slash STT for Smart Tech today. Mm -hmm.